You know, what's funny is that even when it's your own script, there's a, you, there's a point where you just discard it. You have to. Uh, in fact, every stage of filmmaking is a, is a process of discarding everything you expected it to be and trying really, really hard to look at what it is. I've got a picture in my head, I've had it quite a while, of a young boy on a rare rainy day in Los Angeles in the late 60s, perhaps going into the early 1970s, flicking through TV channels and suddenly comes across an afternoon matinee of George Cukor and William Wyler and gets incredibly excited by this <laughs> whole world of melodrama <laughs> and women's pictures. And then a, a week later, he suddenly discovers Douglas Sirk and Max Offels on another channel. <laughs> Is that your youth? Well, I think you might be attributing too much to my youngest, my younger years. A lot of those um, influences were, were filmmakers I encountered a little bit later. Um, but certain films presented themselves to me at a very young age and made an uh, you know, inordinate, a massive impression on me. And sort of, you know, began to sort of inflict some bizarre psychosis, I think, <laughs> that required um, a creative response, a creative answer, and, uh, and an obsession. You know, it started with Mary Poppins when I was three years old. What better way to start? <laughs> um, but there would be certain uh, movies that would just become my, uh, you know, sort of uh, stimulus for, for these sort of periods of my life as a kid. And uh, they, yeah, they, they became way, and then, and then I started to make my own versions of them. Romeo and, the Zeffirelli Romeo and Juliet was probably the next huge obsession when I was seven, around the year you were 68, so that's how old I was. And, uh, and that was the first film I sort of made as a kid and really put a lot of uh, energy and production and obsession into playing all the roles <laughs> Except I even tried playing Juliet, um, and my mom did the, a test in Super 8, so we could try double exposure in the house. I did a sort of painting of the Capulet ball on the wall, and I pop on at one point as, dressed as Juliet. I don't know where that film is. Um, but ultimately, I used a friend to play Juliet, and I played all, the other, played all the other roles in different little tunics that I made out of towels. Moving into your feature debut, 1991's Poison, which won the Grand Jury Prize at Sundance. The film opens um, with the intertitle, The Entire World is Dying of Panicky Fright, which strikes me as summing up pretty much the conservative reaction in America when they find out that the National Endowment for the Arts had given you $25,000 to complete the film. Uh, were you surprised by the level of controversy that the film attracted? Well, no, I, I don't think any of us were surprised by <clears throat> any level of panic during those particular years um, because there was a lot bigger stuff going on than the reaction to Poison. And it was a provocation, the film, you know? It, and it was an invitation, it was a, it was sort of a attempt to defend an embattled minority community that was starting to accept some of the terms of blame and culpability for that epidemic. And this is a film that then became grouped, and you as a director became grouped with people like Tom Kaling, Rose Troche, Greg Araki, Gus Van Sant, Jenny Livingstone, with this very diverse movement that became new queer cinema. Um, what was it like, because you, t you talk about currents at that point in time, um, it was striking being over here, being interested in film, and suddenly hearing about this movement and slowly, these films were filtering through into cinemas in the UK. That mantle or that classification that was given, that was a journalist, B. Ruby Rich's way of de describing this, this movement that had everything to do with, with the AIDS crisis and a lot of people who were coming out of direct activism, like myself as well, um, but were responding to it with narrative or creative um, responses. Uh, I felt that that was never a reductive term. I always thought that, that that actually described not only those artists and, you know, people like Derek Jarman, 
and Isaac Julian, who were British filmmakers, um, but also an, uh, an engaged audience that was there. And maybe for the first time, I mean, the, the art house audience was, also, was al always maybe partly a gay audience. That was a code word for the gay audience. But now it was being defined exactly as that, a new queer cinema audience that was going to buy tickets and go see these movies. And so it created a, a market as well as a, uh, a force of a uh, need to express these ideas. I've mentioned directors, but obviously there's a key person within the mix of, of this trend, and it was the producer, Christine Vachon. Yes. I want to move on to her, because she is one of the most important people in American cinema in the last 30 years. In any time, I find it amazing that your next feature, Safe, from 1995, got made, and what I've read about it, it seems like the perfect collaboration between a director and a producer. Mm. This was a very, very tough sell. It took us two years to get the financing together. We needed a million dollars, but because I, and that was a big step up from Poison, but but Christine just kept saying, no, we're going to get it, we're going to get it. I, I would have given up. I just was like, you know, I was, my career had just started and I didn't really know if it really was going to be a career, you know, and this was a very different turn from Poison. But uh, her persistence, her, her conviction, her support, um, which has remained uh, so seminal to our relationship uh, all these years, and so, you know, really, my, my entire career is owed so much to Christine's tenacity and, and perseverance. It's interesting when you, when you think people talk sometimes disparagingly of this stereotype of a producer, and thinking about your relationship, it strikes me that a better would, would possibly be enabler. Mm -hmm. that, that to work so closely with someone across the whole of a career. Yeah. She's also the dragon slayer. <laughs> you know, she is out there dueling with the powers that be about the financing. And increasingly that, you know, and this, is, this happens with producers and directors, the, the, be, the very best pairings of them, it puts us in different places, often in the course of making a film. But that's why the, a, a remarkable level of trust and uh, faith in, in what, that we're both after the same ends, you know, um, means that we're always bound together, you know, because she, she, she often has to see the big picture while I'm zeroing in on the specifics of getting the shot done. And you need both. There's no way these films could get made without both things being addressed. The other major collaborator in this film, obviously, is Julianne Moore. Mm. I'm just curious about the way that you work together. She came in and she, and she read this voice and all of a sudden, you know, it, it, it talk about the difference between the written word and someone right in front of you. But the thing about Julianne, and I, and, I, and I have to say this is true about so many, it's true about Kate Blanchett, it's true about so many of these incredibly um, courageous actors I've worked with. They know how to, they respect a certain distance from the viewer. They don't have to gain your, uh, your trust or your like, they don't have to be likable. There's nothing obsequious about the way they address the viewer in the film. She knows how to maintain a distance and trusts that the viewer is going to find their way to her. And that just was so true with Carol White. And there was almost no other way to play it, but it, it, was su it took such confidence and such a sense of absolute, you know, a completely, thoroughly fleshed out idea of who this woman was. This is a character who doesn't play to any of the conventions of a character that normally gains an audience's sympathy. Yeah. And this distance is also accentuated by not just the way that you've shot the film, which has this Kubrickian glacial mm. distance, but also Ed Tomney's remarkable score. Yes, that's, thank you for mentioning it. I think it's such a huge and essential part of the film. And of course, there was a Brian Eno temp score through the entire movie. That doesn't every film doesn't does have a every Brian film. Eno temp score? And, uh, and I've worked on all sides of Brian Eno's amazing um, trajectory as an artist in my films. Um, but he really, and there's one Brian Eno song I couldn't give up that's a piece of music that's in the movie I couldn't give up. But Ed really made it his own. Let's 
actually go on to more Brian Eno now, who appears yes. uh, musically in your next film, Velva Goldmine from 1998. It's a fictional account of the glam rock era with two characters who may or may not be David Bowie and uh, Iggy Pop. I love one of your descriptions of the film as being lubed up and coated with glitter. Uh, <laughs> Unlike a lot of other films in the 90s that were made about the 1970s, which feel falsely nostalgic, there's a real love. I learned a great deal about, about the history of glam, the history of uh, queer um, articulation, representation, theater, art from the British, Oscar Wilde on, onward. And, um, but this really was a, a story about a love affair between America and the UK. And of course, this is the, Ewan represents the American factor, that rejection of 60s um, ideology that f came at the very end of the 60s in the form of uh, The Doors and, and Jim Morrison. But it took David Bowie and his unique, um, you know, a, a accumulation of so many different references and ideas that were in the Cross currents of the of the of that moment. I mean, glam rock presupposes sexual ambivalence in every viewer, every listener of the music, you know, and that in and of itself, that insistence on a sort of destabilized uh, notion of self, because it was questioning, you know, gender, it was questioning sexuality, and what it did is because it was this bisexual imagination and this androgynous imagination, it implicated everybody. And I found that even in the 90s when it came out, you know, I was like ready for the, to be, get, get the gay community excited again after Poison. And they were all a little like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because bisexuality destabilizes all, notion, you know, gays and straights alike. And I find that to be still a radical act and still exciting. And, uh, and something about the 70s was ready for it. It's interesting that you said that the 70s was a time, essentially the last progressive decade of the 20th century. But sadly, almost 20 years on from this film, it seems like the last progressive decade up till now. I know, we just keep thinking, oh my god, Reagan was the worst thing that happened. And then... George Bush happened, and now Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz is happening, and you know Donald Trump. It's it, it yeah, definitely... it's so much better here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious about how you locate the, the the emotional core of this film because you have a narrative that begins with Oscar Wilde, is constructed sort of around the narrative structure of Citizen Kane. And yet, what I find astonishing with this film is just how emotionally engaging it is. Mm. Well, I think that's because of the, you know, Christian Bale's character and Christian Bale's performance. Because what was so cool about glam rock also, and I, was that it engaged, it brought the fan into an active participation with the spectacle and asked you to dress up and asked you to <laughs> take part in it. It's why, like Rocky Horror Picture Show, became this cult, ongoing phenomenon, because audiences would dress up in the transvestite garb and, and interact with the, what was going on on screen. And uh, so that was why the, the Citizen Kane stru structure made sense. I wanted the stars to be like Kane, who's being described and filtered through all these various conflicting points of view. The other star of the film, um, is the costume designer Sandy Powell. She's remarkable, both uh, Velvet Goldmine and Far From Heaven. She is quite astonishing. In Far From Heaven, how much collaboration do you have or do you just give her the script and sort of say, go for it? Well, no, we, you know, she, I think she loves it that I care about all those details. I think it means something to, to her. It's true for every creative department. That I that I know of, and ha the heads of departments, uh, production designers, and costume designers, and DPs. You know, I think everyone wants to feel that they have a foundation that they're on, that there's a strategy, that there's a language, and and then and, and that you know the director does care about every element that they bring to it. You know, we had meetings that went on for days about color alone. The uh, Mark Friedberg, the production designer, Sandy, and Ed and I, 
And this was the first film that Ed Lockman shot of mine as well. Um, so it was, uh, so it, it, but then there are accidents that happen where she designs all those dresses in autumnal colors. And of course, autumn was a theme in the script and you hope you're gonna get some autumn you know, while you're shooting in New York in, in the fall. But the fact that those women walk out <laughs> to the exterior of the house and the colors are identical to the colors that she had already dressed them in. Those were little gifts that you, know, you could never even control no matter how much attention you're paying to detail. I'm not there in 2007. By any standards, this is an extraordinary film. I wanted to make a movie about Bob Dylan and I, and I, and I thought, there's no way to do fake versions of Dylan songs. There's, you know, without getting the rights, there's just simply no way. And you know, of all the people, the scariest of them all, uh, I, went to him, I went to him through his manager and, and Jeff said, you know, just write it out, you know, and don't mention like voice of a generation and uh, <laughs> don't say genius. And, and so I wrote as much, you know, as sort of lugubrious and sort of sophomoric or sort of, you know, uncommercial, uh, which it is, um, a description of the concept. Suppositions on a film concerning Dylan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and sent it to Bob with my movies, you know, and which he took on his trailer at some point and watched, I, I assume, because he likes weird movies and art films and stuff. And, you know, a month later, we get a call from Jeff Rosen saying, yeah, you got the life rights and all the music. And basically, it was this gift, this, you know, saying there was a point where we had to keep extending the rights because uh, I was still writing and researching and all that. And I said to Jeff, you know, I called him up. I said, Jeff, you know, this is, this is an intense thing. I feel like I have a responsibility because I'm the first person who's ever been given the rights to tell Dylan's story in any way. So yet on film, except for him. And uh, Jeff said, oh, Todd, don't worry about that. This is your own weird, unique thing. All you have to do is do that. And I'm like, this is Bob Dylan's manager. This is the, the keeper of the gate, the, you know? <laughs> He says no to everybody. And I was given this extraordinary um, freedom. And I, I still can't, I still really can't believe that. I still can't believe I have the music in it that I have and those actors. And, and was Kate Blanchett the first of your characters to come on board? Um, you know, I think it might have been Richard Gere, and <clears throat> who played that weird, you know, cowboy recluse version of Dylan, the Billy the Kid character. And Richard Gere was so lovely and so generous, and he agreed to do it for so little money that it made all the other actors have to follow suit. <laughs> and they all had to do it for a song, so to speak. I had to sort of hound Kate a little bit. Uh, I knew she could do something extraordinary with this challenge. But she was, you know, she was like, you know, really? You think so? And, and then we'd sit and watch the clips of Dylan from 66 and see that androgynous body and that jittery, you know, strangeness that, that I think, because it's such a famous moment, the year he went electric, that it's lost some of the shock value that it must have had at the time. Because he, and you see it in the, in the great Scorsese documentary, No Direction Home, because he draws from all the Benny Baker uh, footage, the color stuff, and really, he had just, uh, once again, so utterly transformed uh, from the Dylan and of Penny Baker's Don't Look Back, only a couple years, only a year before. So it's just phenomenal how, how, how much of a shapeshifter he, he really was. Carol, let's, let's sort of move into that. It's fascinating to see the binary performance that Kate Blanchett gives, being herself, being Carol, but also being Carol through Therese's Absolutely. eyes. And then you've got Rooney Mara, who, for me, this is, this is the most extraordinary performance she's given so far because it is the quieter, it is the less showy performance. Yes. And it's in many ways the tougher performance, perhaps, yeah. but it's extraordinary what she does with it. It is. You are, that is really how you are carried through this story. And, and it's, a, it's the simplest character and maybe the simplest story that she's ever been in of the movies I've seen her do, all of which have impressed me, each performance. <clears throat> but I thought, wow, what would Rooney, who knows how to 
play down and, and be quiet and draw the viewer in to the, to the detail, the smallest nuance, as we've seen her do in other roles. What would she do with this, you know, much simpler character? And this was the first time that you came onto a project that was already in motion. Yeah. What was that experience like for you? Well, it was extraordinary. Um, it was a learning experience, like all of them have been. Um, but, and I had a great relationship with Phyllis Nage, who wrote the adaptation, beautiful adaptation of the novel, which is such a great novel. Um, and for me, this was really addressing the, the shape and form and tradition of the love story in, in movies in ways I felt I never had really exclusively looked at in other films that I've made. And, um, and, and really, uh, and what that led to is, is a real focus on point of view and how much point of view um, sort of anchors you in great love stories, most usually to the, to the more vulnerable party. And, um, and, and what's interesting about Carol is how that shifts. Um, I think Fassbinder, who loves Cirque, Fassbinder number two, this should be like a drinking game every time I mention <laughs> Fassbinder or Cirque. Um, uh, he said that the simplest stories are the truest stories. And, and in many ways, that's what makes great love stories so powerful, is that it, they relate directly to our own experience. Um, and uh, they're, they're apps, you know, and, that's, and, and they, they summon the yearning that we've all had for people in our lives at different times. Um, and it's partly due to how you postpone satisfaction and create obstacles that keep the lovers from satisfying their desires and make an audience think back and go, oh, if only things were different. They often become sto stories about society, moral you know, stories about society and why society gets in the way of people. So I worked with Phyllis a bit on the script. It brought a few, st some structural changes to it. This, the brief encounter sort of structure for people who know that beautiful film and will see Carol or may have seen Carol. You know, what's funny is that even when it's your own script, there's a, you, there's a point where you just discard it. You have to. Uh, in fact, every stage of filmmaking is a, is a process of discarding everything you expected it to be and trying really, really hard to look at what it is because it's always a little different and you have to allow for that, you know? And, and so what you see on set is different from the script and what you see in your dailies is different from what you saw in the flesh and the dailies are not the same as the first cut, and then you learn how the cuts start to play with showing people the, the film. And, um, and so each, you just have to be sometimes ruthless with yourself, and you have to let your favorite scene go because it isn't whole, supporting the whole experience. And so, you know, not to say that whatever, that's just part of the, the process. But, but Phyllis was a partner through, through the whole thing, and as were these two extraordinary actors. And, uh, and Ed Lockman and his amazing cinematography, and, and again, working with Sandy. Um, and Judy Becker, who designed it, who also designed I'm Not There. Can you please join me in thanking Todd Haynes? Thank you. We all live in the explosion of experiences and perspectives that constitute our everyday life, where imperfect, intimate, hastily made images are grabbed, self-made, and shimmer and multiply in endless, dizzying, self-replicating patterns of light and sound, where reality, fact, fiction, as well as identity, nationality, gender, and ethnicity are constantly mixing and merging and in flux.